Welcome to News Cafe, I'm Mitzi Borromeo. Tonight's Mind Brew comes to you from one of my favorite places, the Mind Museum, where science comes alive to tell the story of how humans understand how the world works. What better place to be than right here, where science tickles our minds to understand nature. I'm now with marine biologists from the California Academy of Sciences, Dr. Terry Gosliner, who is the 2014 Philippine Biodiversity Expedition Leader and Senior Curator, and Rich Moy, who is the Curator of Invertebrates. Welcome, guys. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. It's great to be here. It's really good to be here. Great thank you. Have you. Now, this is not your first time to the Philippines. Both of you have done several expeditions before. Can I ask you, Rich, when was the first time you came to the Philippines? I first came to the Philippines in 1992, and uh, have been coming back almost every year since. It's yeah. my second home. Wonderful. And this expedition, tell us briefly, what is this expedition about? This expedition is really to explore the Verde Island Passage, which we know is the center of, the center of marine life yeah. of any place on the planet, and to really understand how that diversity is distributed yeah. across the Verde Island Passage. Yeah. All right, Rich, for you, what brought you to the Philippines the first time? Well, mostly this guy. <laughs> so it was work. Uh, I was here in uh, 2011 to help organize that expedition as well and to participate in both the shallow water and the deep water components, yeah. uh, during which we had access to a really wonderful research vessel and we did a lot of work in the Verde Island Passage, dredging to depths of over a couple of thousand meters. Right. So what is it that, about the Philippines that drew here? Yes, we are the center of the center of marine biodiversity, but tell us about what really, um, what kind of biodiversity we have in the Philippines, Terry? Well, um, certainly, if you're talking about coral reefs, the most important thing of, about coral reefs is corals. And there are more than 500 species of corals now documented from the Philippines. And when people think of coral diversity, they most commonly think of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, yeah. which has a paltry 350 species <laughs> of corals compared to the Philippines. So the Philippines really um, trumps any other tropical area that has coral reefs um, in terms of almost every group of plants and animals that's been studied. Yeah. And Rich, from this expedition, can you tell us what this expedition entails? I mean, how big is the team? What kind of equipment do you need to come here? Well, we were just looking at some of those numbers this morning, and we had, what, over 70, what was it, 70, 74. 74 participants, uh, well over half of which were from uh, our participating organizations here in the Philippines, oh, okay. uh, and um, from a variety of different scientific institutions within the U.S. So it was a fairly complex thing to put together, yeah. but we were really happy to see how it came together at a, at a variety of different localities to have all of these different people come in through... Uh, the expedition and, and do really yeah. amazing work together. Well, in 2011, you discovered 300 new species. Is that right? What did you find in this expedition, Terry? Well, we, we found similar lev levels of new species. We haven't done the final tallies because we've only been back from the field for three days now. And yeah. we're um, coming back to Manila after being in the remote site of Lubang Island yeah. was quite a cultural shock to re-enter civilization and the bustling metropolis of Metro Manila. but I don't know if it's um, better or you prefer to be back there, out in the paradise? There are elements of each, and yeah. if you could combine all of those, you'd have the ideal world. But Lubang Island is a, a biological paradise. It's a beautiful island. Um, the people are so friendly and welcoming. It was a great place to conduct field work, but it's nice to be back with some of the creature yeah. comforts as well. Can you take us through what it was like? Maybe paint a picture for maybe what a day would be like. Sure. In being out there so remote. Well, usually our day would start um, with, literally with the crowing of roosters uh, <laughs> at five o'clock <laughs> in the morning clock. or so. <laughs> and, and so uh, between, if it wasn't the roosters, the sun rising, um, 
and then you start your day, you have a quick breakfast, uh, and then you start gearing up for uh, your morning diving, of, which usually lasts till about two in the afternoon. Mm. Then you bring back the animals that you've found and collected and document them, do photography, uh, basically take detailed notes of what you found and document everything. And that takes you um, well into the evening to do all of that process and usually till 11 or sometimes 1 in the morning. And then you start again the next morning at 6. So um, it's it's, um, a very tiring experience, but you're so into it and you're so involved in it that it your days go very quickly (laughs) and you can't wait to wake up for the next day of of new surprises and new discoveries yeah and when you're working with a with a fantastic team that also makes it seem like almost no time at all has passed uh i i would also add that sure there are discoveries that you make when you're actually doing the diving and the swimming around and looking at stuff but a lot of times the really big discoveries are made when you have the material back in the laboratory and you have a chance to make detailed comparisons of what it is that you found and um, lots of times in the middle of the night even though people are dead tired they're saying oh man I just found this fantastic (laughs) thing you know Uh, so it's always every minute is exciting it doesn't matter where you are so you can't actually say now how many new species you discovered Uh, it's pretty difficult I can highlight some of the ones that really stood out to me in my own group Mm -hmm. but we don't have all of the information yet from all of the specialists can you give an example of something they have found Uh, well I yeah and I and I know that uh, Terry can as well one of the things that we found in Mabini was um, a sea urchin from about 85 feet that I'd certainly never seen before. It took me uh, a a couple of days to figure out even what what major group it belonged to within the sea urchins. And it looks like it's a kind of living fossil, almost like a holdover from the Eocene about 60 million years ago that just happens to be there and no one's ever seen it before. And uh, it it was pulled up and I thought, what the heck is that thing? <laughs> and uh, got very excited when I managed to narrow down right. what, what it actually was. So. Well, there was this twi- this first ever survey you did, isn't it? That twilight, what is it called? Like the twilight, the twilight zone. zone. Yeah. The twilight yeah. zone dive. Tell us about that. Very Well, um, we didn't get to participate directly, but our colleagues did. And um, it's it's just like going down into to deep space, only yeah. in, you're wow. wet. And yeah, instead of... On average, our dives would last about an hour, an hour and a half. These were all four to five hour dives, and wow. and it's quite exhausting. So they would have to take in their goodie bags. They'd take bananas and things like that that they can eat, and, and yeah. um, energy bars and things like that, yeah. which by the time you open them up underwater, taste pretty salty, oh, but you really need the energy. Wow. And so it's... Uh, for about you know 20 or 30 minutes of actual exploration at the deepest depth, you and are how down deep there. Was that? When you say the deepest, um, the deepest that? that they went was about 145 meters. Wow! So 450 400. feet. Wow! Okay. My gosh! So what do you see under there? I mean, you must see it's like alien creatures. Yeah. Well, well, without you, lights, you don't see much because that's why it's called the twilight yeah. zone. The yeah. light starts filtering out through the seawater above until it's quite dark at that level. But um, they certainly saw lots of interesting new fish. And um, one of the challenges that they were trying to overcome was to bring some of those fish live to the surface because they would really like to make an exhibit of those. And so they developed all kinds of interesting technologies for decompressing the fish because they need to decompress much like the people do. Uh, when they come oh. to the surface. And then you have to bring these back to the United States. Yes. yes. So that's also, so this is a big task in terms yeah. of and, packing them and up. And they're b- back there safe and sound, some of them, because that group uh, left a little earlier than we did, and yeah. so they're all doing well in, in San Francisco. How do you know when you've seen a new species? I mean, with all of them, and then sometimes you, you can't even see what you're seeing well, under in the twilight zone. That, that's... Um, In the case of the nudibranchs, it's pretty easy because they have very distinctive color patterns. And so that's why I think that I'm pretty confident that we found at least 40 new species of nudibranchs. Um, So um, the reason that you know that it's a new species is that you're familiar with all of them. And it's basically, I tell people it's very similar to going into a room full of people and you obviously know the ones that you already know. So here's a new, something that looks different. Yeah, they're familiar and... And you know, 
oh, I don't know that person. And it's yeah. the same thing with, yeah. with species. Well, you brought up nudibranchs. You are the leading researcher. You are the king of nudibranchs. I, you discovered, uh, what is it, 700 now or more? More than 900 from the Philippines. Yeah. And mostly from Batangas. Batangas mostly. is the capital, the nudibranch capital yes, of the world. Yes, definitely. Why are they so, you know, I think mostly we get, you know, just enamored by the big creatures like the whale shark, the whales and dolphins. Mm -hmm. We kind of gloss over these little things like sea urchins <laughs> and the not so good looking ones, but why are they so important to look at also? Well, the nudibranchs um, are small, they're very colorful. They're colorful because they have toxic chemicals, which are also have potential value to humans as new pharmaceutical products. But um, they are also very important because if you have a lot of species of nudibranchs, that's an indicator that you have a very healthy reef system. Right. And so it's an indicator of the, the health of the environment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One, of, one of the things that we're finding out as we do this kind of research, and this is particularly applicable to the Verde Island Passage, is that the more species you have in an e ecosystem, the more stable the ecosystem is. Mm -hmm. And so one of the remarkable attributes of the Verde Island Passage is not just its diversity, but its resilience to change, to modification right. through human uh, activities and, and even natural disasters like typhoons yeah. or global warming, which results in uh, bleaching events. The organisms there can recover from something like that yeah. because there are so many players on the field at the same time right. and they can right. fill in each other's roles until the ecosystem becomes more stable yeah. again. So what makes Verde Island so rich? Why is it the center of the center? What well, makes life thrive there? there? There are a variety of different reasons for that and people have their own favorite reasons. Uh, part of it is the geologic, the deep geologic history of the Philippines, which is complex. Uh, the introduction of different kinds of environments through geologic time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's also partly due to the fact that there is speciation going on within the Philippines. There are little pockets of areas where you get uh, what they call genetic separation or, yeah. or cessation of gene flow, which yeah. allows uh, new species to arise. But certainly for the group that I've been looking at, the sea urchins, what we're seeing is that it's uh, part of what we call the center of overlap hypothesis, which means that there are a lot of different ranges of organisms that converge here in the yeah. Philippines. And it's like any great tourist uh, attraction, any great tourist place. Yeah. Uh, these organisms find it very hospitable in the Verde Island Passage. Yeah. And that brings you to another reason, which is that the Verde Island Passage has a lot of current flow, a lot of what we call upwelling, which brings nutrients from the deep water that these organisms can live on. And so if they do happen to find themselves here in their overlapping ranges, uh, they find a really nice yeah. buffet table waiting for them <laughs> and, like and they can make it through and establish themselves here. And this is perhaps what makes it one of the best, if not the best diving site Absolutely. in the world. Oh, wow, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely yeah. Um, true that it's a sp spectacularly beautiful area. And one of the things that we know is that, that as Rich had said, it's been very stable for a long period of time. Yeah. And if you contrast that with the Visayas, the various islands in the Visayas, when changes in sea level and ice ages have been united and separated repeatedly, yeah. whereas the Verde Island Passage has been a constant um, ah. separation between northern Mindoro and southern Luzon right. for probably 60 million years. All right, well, we just need to take a quick break. Okay. We will be back. News Cafe will be right back.
Welcome back to News Cafe. I'm talking to marine biologists from the California Academy of Sciences, Dr. Terry Gosliner and Dr. Rich Moy. Okay, guys, we were just talking about the ex um, expedition earlier. What is it like on there? I mean, there are some perils that you have to face, no? Maybe some of the creatures that are not very friendly. Can you tell us about some of the difficult times that you have on an expedition, Rich? Well, I think um, I, I would think that apart from the sort of natural dangers of diving, yeah. Um, I think there are one of the reasons we bring uh, a special group of highly trained folks with us, our dive safety um, officers with us on, in the field, is to make sure that all the safe diving practices are followed. Yeah. Um, I think for the most part, people are more afraid of sea urchins than <laughs> anything else. Um, They're scary, those things. They, they can be, and um, they are things that you don't want to pick up unless you're you know, trained to handle those babies. You know? right. So it's... Um, uh, something that I think every I try to let people know because that's the group that yeah. I work on a little bit about what the organisms are that that right. they should and shouldn't touch. And you were diving in the height of summer where we have a lot of jellyfish. So there is are it common some. That you there get are some. some. There are some. Uh, but I think certainly one or two of our colleagues had a very special scientific interest in those, and so they were happy to see them. <laughs> uh, they weren't upset about them at all. <laughs> that's, that's the fun with scientists. You yeah, know. and, you never and know. it's just you know one of the hazards of the job. You, yeah. Occasionally, you feel a little sting, and and um, you know. But to tell you the truth, um, things like mangrove flies and things like that Hello were um, I got on land were <laughs> were, I didn't even know about were that. more of a nuisance than anything we found in the ocean. And we were really lucky because yeah. there are hazardous creatures. We saw yeah. blue blue ring octopus, which can kill you, and sea snakes, uh, yeah. um, lionfish. Um, so there are lots of things that that there's a potential for a problem, but yeah. with a little care, yeah. they are, as Rich said, more afraid of us yeah. than we are. <laughs> what would you say are maybe the most difficult parts or most challenging aspects of an expedition like this? Well, I think the biggest challenge really is getting the logistics, and they're very complex, and particularly when you're at a remote site that doesn't have any infrastructure for diving, you have to bring that from elsewhere, you have to, and you're never sure despite the reconnaissance you've done and the oculars that you've done in advance to, to try and figure out how it's all going to work, you don't really know until you actually show up. Yeah. And so you have to be flexible, adaptable, and, right. and respond to changing circumstances. Yeah. And, and that, to me, is the key to success. Yeah. As, as a good colleague of mine often says, it, 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 why would, they wouldn't call it research if you knew what you were doing. Um, and uh, oftentimes, that's the great fun of it, facing those challenges, making sure that um, everybody is, is facing those challenges safely, but also being able to do the work that, that they do so well together. Uh, and making those discoveries. It's, That's right. It, it's never a dull moment. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, this is, there is a tedious process when it comes to science and research. It really takes a lot of patience. Yeah. Yeah. Field work is the best aspect of that research, yeah. though. And Rich <laughs> mentioned some of the aspects of, uh, you know, diving. And when you're doing diving um, every day, you, about every week, you should take a day off and uh, let some of the nitrogen that's been building up in your bloodstream uh, dissipate right. and so we try to be very sensible in that and um, um, take breaks and and you know to make yeah. sure that people don't get dehydrated because right. then you're susceptible to right. to getting things like decompression si sickness and you a just have of, to be very sensible yeah, be very careful now of course there's also a lot of beauty that you encounter during this expedition you encountered a huge mass spawning event which is once in a, what is it, once every how many years? Um, well, it's, it's uh, usually a couple times a year okay. um, that corals spawn. And um, we did see, not in, actually in 2011, we saw an even greater event because we were doing a lot more night diving. Um, and that's when it usually occurs. But mm -hmm. we did see some coral spawning. Yeah. And a lot of reproduction going on um, of corals just uh, having a good time getting together. Yeah. And... Uh, that's what they do best. Yeah. What does this um, say about the area? I mean, once back in the day, Anilao, Batangas was very much um, uh, an area where there's a lot of illegal fishing. And yeah. When you dove before, Terry, the, your first dive, you said you used to hear dynamite fishing. Yeah, I remember very fishing? distinctly yeah. one of those early dives I made. Um, there was a huge explosion I felt underwater, and I thought my eardrums had been blown out. There were fish dying right next to me uh, right. from the concussion of the explosion and then so I carefully came up to the surface and 
one of the things that I discovered, and I asked the, the banqueros in the, the boat, I said, you know, what happened? And they said, there's no boats around. So this was probably a, a kilometer or more away. Yeah. Um, and yet still the effects on a reef so distantly were yeah. really profound. It killed the fish. And of course, if it's at ground zero where those explosions occur, it completely destroys the coral. And you may get a lot of fish, but you won't get them next time. Mm -hmm. It won't get them for 30 or 40 or, or even 100 years yeah. after that. So in terms of the changing ecosystem, you know, where we have a whale shark behind us, there's an mm -hmm. area in the Visayas called Oslob where the whale sharks yes. seem to be coming in because they're being fed. Why is that a bit um, controversial? People, uh, environmentalists are a little bit concerned that this is not really the proper way. Well, I think people are always concerned that um, any time that humans, even with very good intentions, try to change the natural balance, um, there are cascading effects. There are other effects that, that and basically, um, one of the, the concerns is that, that the Bhutan Ding are going to become habituated to humans and um, depend on humans rather than their natural sources of food, and that they may change their migration patterns, they may not travel as free, far because they've got a good, yeah. easy life, um, thanks yeah. to us. Yeah. And we don't want to disrupt those natural yeah. uh, patterns because that's what builds the resilience and ability to survive changing environments. Right. And, and so any interference that we have um, compared to the millions of years of, of working things out through the process of evolution yeah. is something you don't want to monkey with. Right, right. Now, during your expedition, Sue, you encountered shark finning, was it? Or you saw people hunting sharks? Tell us about that. This is well, a big problem still. Also. We didn't actually see the actual hunting, but we do know that there were sharks being collected in the area where, yeah. we, where we were. Um, and this is um, certainly something that we think needs some very careful scrutiny and, yeah. and actually, frankly, to be stopped. Because uh, in any ecosystem, the top predators are sitting on top of a food pyramid and they're at the, the, that apex, but everything, all of the energy flow in the ecosystem runs through them eventually. And if you start destabilizing, destabilizing the pyramid from the top like that, yeah. uh, you have very deep effects. Uh, an analogy of that was um, uh, brought home to me recently when we started reading uh, some of the scientific reports about what's happening to say deer in North America, right. where if you take out the coyotes and the wolves, the deer explode in population and people start having all kinds of trouble with deer in their backyard eating their stuff but even right. worse the deer carry ticks that have yes. disease and so on and so there are cascading effects that are very difficult to predict whenever you as terry says monkey with the ecosystem yeah. this is why we were suffering from overfishing isn't it right that too right how stark a problem is that for well the asia pacific and the philippines what statistics might we are is it well, the of our stuff? i think there are large areas of the philippines and certainly we see this in Mabini when we're outside of the marine protected areas, that there are very few fish and there are only very small individuals. Yeah. And the only places you really see schools of really large fish are in the marine protected areas. And a few really isolated places like Tubataha Reef, which yeah. is so famous for diving because yeah. there are lots of large fish. And right. it really is representative of what a natural ecosystem should look like everywhere in the Philippines. Right. Now, a big problem here, too, is that the people themselves are exploiting the resources. So you, yes. a big part of your work, too, you work with communities, including fishermen. Mm -hmm. You try to educate them on the proper way to do this. Tell us about some of these encounters and how they are receiving your, your visits right. and well, research. Well, in one of the things that we feel is really important is for scientists to speak with local members of the community and to um, basically explain what we're doing in their own backyard, what possible benefit that could have to local communities and to really talk to the fisher folk about <clears throat> what are more sustainable ways that they can continue to have a livelihood, feed their families and make sure that there's enough um, right. for future generations. And so that's why we've talked so much about uh, non-sustainable fishing practices, eliminating dynamite and cyanide fishing of um, really making sure that, that it's just a sustainable catch rather than one that is really depleting the natural populations. Yeah. And that's why things like marine protected areas where there are sanctuaries that can repopulate other areas are so critically important. Mm -hmm.
I think the other um, thing that I would add to that is that um, Filipinos and Filipinas have every right to be incredibly proud of this wonderful marine diversity that they have right off their doorstep. And so we are taking every opportunity to bring that home to them through outreach activities. We reached, what, 900 people or something through our outreach yeah. activities in the last couple of months. And for me, as a researcher, I, I kind of look at it as, as the same way that there's a symbiosis between corals and the little single-celled organisms, the single-celled plants that live in their tissues that make coral reefs grow so well. Yeah. Research and education are like that symbiosis. So you have a, a, a way of making the sum much greater than, than the addition of the parts. You, you can grow this out like a coral reef grows yes. so well. You can grow uh, this... Uh, research and, and, and educational aspect to the point where people are seeing what it is that we're seeing as research right. scientists right. and understanding why it is we come back here every That's year. Right. Uh, and, and too often scientists just feel that their role is exclusively to, to do, un, do scientific research yeah. and um, increasingly the world is changing and the, there's an expectation and an obligation of scientists to really bring to the forefront what are the better ways that science tells us of managing the world's ecosystems and making sure that they're there for future yeah. generations. Good thing to think about while we take this short break. Okay. News Cafe will be back after these messages. Welcome back to News Cafe, and we are talking to amazing marine biologists about marine conservation. All right, we were just talking about your outreach projects. What exactly happens in these projects? How do you work with the communities? Uh, well, Terry actually um, starts out by explaining why it is that we're there. We, we invite uh, participants, local uh, community members, uh, local government agencies to come and take part in these massive almost science rallies uh, in a way uh, where we have um, the folks come and, and listen to Terry talk about the expedition and I'll say a few words about the expedition when I can and uh, we open it up to questions but the favorite part for everybody is that before we start any of that usually in the morning before or the evening before uh, we go out into our favorite place the reefs and uh, collect some organisms put them in basins uh, so that they're ready for people to look at bringing the ocean to them. To them, yes. Yeah, yes. for, these for at least a little while. these things they've never seen before. Probably. That's right. They, don't, yeah. they live and, there, but they don't mm, understand it. And them. most of the people who live in coastal communities don't swim. That's so true. Many and, Filipinos don't want to swim. And yeah. so how would they have any idea of what yeah. was living in their own backyard? And that's, that's right. part of what we can do is just bring to light the wonder and beauty of, of the creatures that are found right in their own um, coastal waters. Right. And, and to, that's the first step of building understanding is... Changing mindsets. Yeah, and changes. just opening up that world. Yeah. And there's nothing like the real stuff to do that with. Yeah. That's true. You can talk and talk and talk, but if you show someone the gorgeousness of a sea urchin or the beauty in a fish or even oh, a yeah. worm, yeah. Um, or even a nudibranch for that matter. Or uh, a sea urchin. Yeah, yeah. Or a sea urchin. <laughs> sea urchins are kind of Things that are normally seen as ugly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you really see this appreciation among them changes. Does it change oh, then their, it does whether change. they've been exploiting the seas, it changes. Yeah, yeah. you can and, see that And just that faces. building that understanding of what these things are, what, you know, there's fear of the unknown and so, People are afraid to touch even things like a starfish because they don't know what it's right. going to do to them. That's and right. then we assure them, and I will touch it, or Rich will touch it, and Nothing we show like them how to appropriately do that. The magic of education. That. And, yeah. and you can just see their eyes light up when they do that because yeah. they've made the connection. And physical touch right. is really an important way of making that connection. It's true. How does your work translate into policy? I mean, in the Philippines, we have a lot of environmental problems, and the government isn't really big on prioritizing these issues. How do you make sure that your research plays into policy? Well, um, in lots of different ways. And I think a lot of it is at the local level and, yeah. and dealing with municipal 
officials and uh, members of LGUs um, because really, regardless of what the, the national government does, you, unless you have buy-in from people, members of the community, it's not going to work. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons that we spend so much time with local mayors and um, yeah. uh, council members and barangay captains and, and basically members who are actually going to be influential in their own communities because mm -hmm. that's how it really starts. But we also work at the national level too um, with conservation partners like um, PUSAD, which is a small environmental organization that's a key partner of ours in Batangas, and right. then with large um, and, uh, NGOs like Conservation International that's global in reach and yet has a very strong component here in the Philippines. And working together to translate the science into policy and um, building those relationships between the national leaders, um, members of, at the cabinet level within yeah. the national government, yeah. um, leaders of, of the major um, environmental policy arms of the government, such as BFAR, um, yeah. the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic right. Resources, is a very important collaborator of ours and has been so since we first started working here in the Philippines in 1992. Yeah. How and, have, oh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say that it goes beyond just when we're working with them here, uh, this continues even when we go back, not, not only because we're feeding into the information stream out there in the scientific community about the organisms we find here, but we're always open to questions if people want to email us photos and things like that uh, to, to identify things or to say right. what there's, their environmental significance yeah. might be. And, and our um, in-country partners like, like BFAR and NFRDI um, are always willing to, to yeah. come and talk to us for just as we are ready to ask them questions about yeah. the next great place to go and, and see things. Um, I would also say that it's events like this one, uh, being able to speak to the media, being able to get our message out through documentaries, uh, through other uh, sort of less traditional, stuffy scientific conferences right. um, that are, are a crucial, crucial way yes. of getting that message out. I think yeah. um, a, a government official might sit down and look at this interview. Right. Um, but perhaps he, working with the Mind Museum. That's you right, did your perhaps. First marine science camp perhaps, the exactly. That, we did a great yeah. camp with them. Yeah. So. so we're going to see more of that. Yeah. I sure hope so. Yeah. It, it's a great partnership. What would you say was your favorite part of this camp? I mean, it was a wonderful camp. Oh, we there's uh, the, of the camp itself, swimming with the kids. Yeah. 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 No, like no, yeah. no doubt about it. Swimming with the kids. And, you know, we had kids who'd never been in the water before to um, some who had so much knowledge that they were already budding <laughs> marine biologists. And, and having that broad spectrum of interest and Really experience. showing us up out there. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like... Your, your competition. Yeah. yeah. Your competition. Well, that's the next generation. Uh, our we want, our we want next that. colleagues. So, right. uh, the, no, and it was great. And to have families together doing that and sharing yes. that experience was tremendously important to have yeah. that right. intergenerational connection with yeah. the ocean. It truly is about the kids. Whenever anybody asks me about why it is in my heart that I do this kind of work, I think of my own son, I think of the families of others and, and, and children everywhere who are going to inherit this planet from us and right. we should be doing the best we can to leave it in a condition where they can be carrying that pride in, the, in that environmental sense of sustainability and keeping things going for their children. And the other thing is, it's a lot easier to change the mindset of young people than it is older people like ourselves. So. Um, it is not. It, <laughs> it is not. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> not a skeptical. Yeah. See, he won't change his mind about anything. Um, yeah. But uh, he's been my roommate for seven weeks now. You're getting a little punchy. Yeah. Yeah. Cabin fever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How has it changed? You've been here for so many years, especially you, Terry. How yeah. do you think the environment has changed, whether it's for the better or the worse? You well, know, you know, research? we were talking about Mabini and, and how... You know, I can dive on the reefs in Mabini that I know like my own backyard. Um, and most of them are in much better shape now than they were 20 years, 20 something years ago when I first started looking at them. And that's really encouraging and, and really points to a bright future. It yeah. shows that with the right kind of stewardship, you can actually make improvement in the natural environment. And and that's a tremendous message that we really want to reinforce. It's not too late. Yeah. Yeah. We can make a huge difference today in yeah. 
building the future that we want to have. Exciting and I think people. that's mm -hmm. one of the things that universally everybody shares is yeah. that, that we want to ha have a bright future for our yes. grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Right. This is true. Rich. I mean, so many people say, oh, well, it's too late for this or it's too late for that. But what Terry is saying gets to the heart of the matter is that it really is not too late. We yeah. can make a difference now. And it's through this, this symbiosis uh, mm. of research and education that I think we can make the most difference in yeah. the sort of thing that we as scientists at the academy and, and just in the general community um, feel that in our hearts, that that, that will right. make a difference. So. And throughout the Philippines, there's a growing awareness about the environment and people are passionate about it, and particularly young people. Um, I don't want to harp on the old people because... <laughs> We old people are doing a reasonably good job as well, but especially young people who are really dedicated to think that and very not throwing plastics yeah. in the ocean, of banning plastics in local communities, of um, you know, steps, not way, introducing yeah. stuff into the environment that is really an eyesore and and also does damage to the the organisms that live in those environments. Yeah. So even small things can make a huge difference. We have bigger problems like global climate change but yes. um, and coral reefs are very susceptible to climate change but by reducing the other stressors that humans put on those organisms their likelihood of making it through the climate change challenges is far increased because um, right. we reduce those other stresses on them. Well at the California Academy of Sciences of course this is the legacy you're leaving this education, I mean, leading efforts in this field. You have the biggest, is it the live coral, deep live coral exhibit, which features a Philippine, yes, it's the Steinhardt Aquarium. Yes, correct. This was 10 years in the making, huh? Yeah. Tell us about that. Why did you decide to have this particular exhibit? Well, one of the things that we are all about is the diversity of life, how it got there, and how to sustain that life on the planet. And if you're going to talk about um, the marine environment, you better talk about the most diverse place on the planet for marine organisms, and that means talk about the Philippines. Also, you know, we have a huge Filipino uh, community in the, in the Bay Area, and we wanted yeah. to connect with them. The, and we work very closely with Bay Area Filipinos and Philams to um, really help us Great. figure out how to more effectively communicate positive messages about um, the work that's being done here in the Philippines yeah. to protect coral reefs. Yeah. And so um, it was a great partnership that started in the Bay Area that then permeated back here in the Philippines yeah. through family connections and, and other things. And, and that really launched us into another whole way of interacting um, with the Philippines, which, yeah, which has been it. so profitable. Yeah. And when we talk about what are the most important things that we've we've done on this expedition or other expeditions, it's really connecting with people. And that is as gratifying and exciting as the scientific discoveries that we make to me. Absolutely. It's, it's so rewarding and it makes us come back and it, it fills our hearts with hope and, and um, good thoughts for the future. We were, dry, we were riding in a taxi yesterday together and I said, Terry, you've, you've, you've given this place um, to me, really bad. I've got a, a terrible, <laughs> terrible well, we're bad. we're glad. Glad. Um, you know, I, I, glad if someone had told me that 20 years ago I would feel like this about a place on Earth, um, I would have just said, Matt, Philippines? I, I don't even know where that is. I wonder if I can even point it out on a map. Um, Wonderful. But so that means you'll be coming back then. What's absolutely. Next? We'll absolutely. We'll be seeing you back here and yeah. more research. Absolutely. Coming back. Every There's opportunity. There's always more to do. And Wonderful. Um, the work never ends. All right. Well, thanks very much for being on the show. Thank you. And thanks for all you do. So Thank you so see you much. When you're back. It is our pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very Vincent. much, Terry and right. Rich. News Cafe will be right back. watching News Cafe and now I'm joined by Maria Isabel Garcia, curator of the Mind Museum and science writer. 
Welcome, Maribel. Thanks for joining Hi, us. Hi, Mitzi. Nice so to be the, back. The Marine Science Camp, the first time for you and mm -hmm. a partnership with the Academy. What was it like? Oh, it was so incredible. It was a, like a dream come true for us because we, we, we've been friends for a while. They came on the first day the museum opened in 2012. And when we, the first time we talked, we immediately said we'd set our sights on having a collaboration. Yeah. So it took a while because they had to plan the expedition. And when they did, I approached them right away and we formed the plans for this marine science camp. So what is it like working with an academy, a, such a prestigious academy? And sometimes it's very difficult to establish such collaboration. It was fascinating as well as um, incredibly, it was so awesome that we, we were in a group together and with people who were not scientists, being taught by scientists, but sharing this sense of wonder for, for it all, especially in the oceans. And it was grounded at the same time. An uh, experience like that is very rare, yeah. where you get to be, where you get to cultivate your sense of wonder from the ground up, which is, in this case, the oceans. Yeah. So it, I think it was a, such a rare and incredible experience for the participants who were about 44, aged 6 to 70. Wow. Yeah. So family event. Yes, we, a... it was very, very deliberate on our part to make it a family activity because we, we don't differentiate between learning, formal learning, adult learning, child learning. Learning is learning, and it always has to be active. So we figured if, you, if children learn these things with their parents, then the learning doesn't stop there, because when they're at home, it's continually reinforced, and as they grow up, they can discuss things even after the experience. Yeah. And we think it was quite successful in that, and because they keep still you know, sending us email and asking us th for questions about how to further the experience. And you had other rock star scientists or personalities in marine conservation. You had a film underwater videographer and photographer? Yes, we couldn't be luckier because at the same time we were there, there were two National Geographic explorers who've been coming to that part of the country in Anilao. Particularly, we were at Ayana Resort. And we were there, and they were they were also there wondering what we were doing and they approached us and said what you what are you doing so we explained to them that it's a marine science camp and they were even the ones who volunteered to tell us their story yeah. you know and share it with the kids and the adults alike in the marine science camp so the participants were the luckiest bunch ever i think in terms of a marine science yeah. camp now this is just one of the activities you had for the summer this summer you seem to have had a lot of uh, activities for kids mostly tell us about some of the other activities that the mine museum has for children. It was a full summer. If, um, it was not just for kids, in fact. We had about seven full programs that ranged from solving crimes, CSI style. It's really CSI style, you know, fingerprinting, blood typing, and we actually staged different crimes in the museum for different age groups to solve. Yeah. We had soccer science to make you better players, to learn the science of um, the game first before you... We actually went to the turf to play the game that night. Uh, we did it, we did that twice. We also had forensic science, yeah. uh, forensic art, where we had artists make composite um, figures of uh, suspects based on evidence. And we also had, the most recent one was the teacher wonder workshop, where we had a couple of, um, not a couple actually, it was a lot, it was about 75 public wow. school teachers, yeah. where we helped them cultivate their sense of wonder for science. Yeah. What do you see in these things? I mean, you've trained public school teachers before. When you see them in this setting and the kind of experiences you bring them, what really changes in them? How does it affect their work, their lives even? I would like to think that the, the change is very deep, that it, it would happen not just on the last day, but that it would be lasting. That's what we were hoping for in this workshop. It, we don't... We don't claim to know how to make lesson plans or those lists that teachers make before they go to school. But after the three-day workshop, I was so gratified when one teacher told me, you know, you don't even know how to teach me to do a lesson plan. But you all, but for some reason, that night when I was doing my lesson plan, 
I did it so well, I did it fast, and I did several. I yeah. can't wait to get into my class. And I think that was what we were really aiming for, yes. for that kind of recharging and inspiration for yeah. the public school teachers to begin classes that way, charged yeah. with such a sense of wonder to teach science to our kids. And the same for the kids. You have another program, the Junior Mind Movers. Here, Mind yes. Movers are the guys. That's a classic, yes. We've had that for since the first year. Yeah. Um, it's the Junior Mind Mover program is for different ages, but that would... That's intensive training for this bunch of kids to learn everything that it takes to learn how to communicate science, which means you don't just learn the science, but you learn the art of communication as right. well as other arts in order to convey the science, theater, drawing, Holistic costumes, yes, yeah. and language. So we call these kids our kids because they grew up here since yeah. the, three years ago, so they've been coming back since then. And we always ask them to, they even judge the science shows of the teachers. So wow. that was cool, yeah. They become mini experts yes. almost. Yes. And it's wonderful to hear what the parents have to say because they see the change in the way their children think and behave. Yes, that's another reward that we we in the we who work in the museum get quite often, uh, especially after the program. We got a letter from a parent telling us that we don't know what you did. We really don't know what you did, but our kid who never listened in class before, suddenly when he went back to school, suddenly qualified for the Olympiad. This was last year. And so this kid went back to the Junior Mind Mover program holding his three Olympiad, science and math Olympiad medals. He was, we were so <laughs> proud of him. His name's Ryan. <laughs> and these kids are also uh, more inspired to do their work, right? Now they do their homework Yes, that's better. what they tell us. Yeah. <laughs> We hope that's true, but yes, Changing that's what behavior. they tell us, yes. That's now, the Mind Museum has done parents. so much for the Filipino community. In fact, you were recognized internationally for, uh, you got the Thea Award just last April. It was given in Disneyland, huh? And, uh, tell us about this award. Yes. Um, Congratulations. Well, we didn't nominate ourselves for it, so it was a bit of a surprise. It's the Academy um, Awards, basically. Apparently, it's, it's, yes, it's a, it dubbed the Academy Awards for compelling places and experiences. And the classic... Um, award for Science Museum as only the only Science Museum I saw there, at least one of the more prominent ones was the Exploratorium, which is the mother of all science, uh, uh, interactive science museums. Yeah. So it was such an honor to be given the award um, and together with other compelling places like all the Disney experiences, yeah. which and they are the Hall Amazing. of Famers yeah. For, yeah. for this award. Well, if you let me read the citation, um, the Mind Museum was cited as going the extra step in expanding science into a fully experiential world, creating unusual scale, playful details, and interactivity throughout. Um, it demonstrates true excellence in design and execution. And this world-class design combined with sensory-rich experiences make the Mind Museum a truly outstanding achievement in the museum category. So you gave, of course, a nice, wonderful speech there. I mean, this was a time when we just had, uh, the Philippines had experienced a lot of hardships. Yes, so I only had two minutes to do that. So, okay. so to do that speech, so the f and I, I, the first thing that came to my mind was, we the Philippine the Philippines ranked number three in the World Risk Index, mm -hmm. and we just experienced the most destructive typhoon ever recorded in history. Yeah. So I figured this could only be a happy record that yeah. we're setting that we're the first science museum in Asia to win it and the first Philippine institution to wow, get one. Amazing. So, and there were. A couple of big groups to thank uh, our board, of course, for laughing enough at our dreams to support it and really, you know, getting amused at all our plans and yeah. actively supporting it. The scientists from all over the world who came to help us, and of course the artists, particularly uh, Ed Kalma, who designed the building and most of the big exhibits. Because this was really a project that happened because the arts came to rescue the sciences so that it can be communicated to the public correctly, clearly, right. and beautifully. It was so amazing was that the other awardees were actually, you blew their minds that they wondered, how are you able to do this? You put together a very different museum and that's it, bridging the arts and sciences. Well, not, after, not, not before. I was blown away by their own accomplishments. I was getting nervous and nervous when my presentation was coming because... You know, it was the Titanic that was staged in Ireland. Wow. And the, um, this amazing experience of Le Machine de Lille in France, France where they had walking elephants and giant birds. Like a movie set come to yes. life. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, Michael Jackson's uh, Cirque du Soleil won, right. won, and Gardens by the Bay Imagine in Singapore won. You're so, in that we, level, and, yeah. And we're the Science Museum that won. Uh, in that category. So, so you couldn't believe you were there. We, I just, you know, 
I, I couldn't believe, but at the same time, deeply and probably will be grateful for the rest of our lives yeah. for that honor. Well, it's been about two years since the Mind Museum opened. How do you think uh, the community has changed? How have Filipinos changed, at least from their reaction since that time? One of the things that struck us when we opened in 2012 were from their reactions and when they came was that they said, it's about time. And that was the thing that we were looking for, that we, they also knew, as well as we did, that this story, is, this story, it's time this story is told, this story of science and how it connects to our lives, particularly in our setting here in the Philippines. Yeah. So I think it has changed quite significantly in that we know we now have this place for our collective sense of wonder. Yeah, it's great to have this place. One of my favorite places here. Now, it inspires so many people. One of our big problems now is the brain drain. Our good people are leaving. In fact, we need more scientists. How is the Mind Museum contributing or, or addressing this problem? How do you, you try to... You don't pretend to know that we can, the Mind Museum can fill those spaces in science because I think it's a layered problem. Um, and I don't think it's an easy problem as just filling science posts. I think our role in the museum is to breed a culture that appreciates the sciences and supports the sciences, whether or not you do the science yourself. So if I think we help the public understand what it is that scientists do or what science in general can do for our lives so that our lives are better, will improve and will get better, if we can make people understand that, um, I think we're doing our job. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing you hope, I mean, the legacy of the museum, of course, this is something that's still expanding. What is it that you hope to leave behind with the museum? Or maybe what message is, is it bringing to the country or to the Filipinos? I'd like to think that we, if we just stay on spot in terms of inspiring people to understand nature, and that's what we always tell people. We're just really here to provide you an extraordinary educational experience that inspires you to understand nature. We won't do the classroom method of teaching you in a rigorous way, but we'll bring you at the cusp where there's a point of no return. You can't go back anymore. You're already inspired to understand for yourself, whether it's in the classroom or for yourself, or you go back to the museum. Yeah. There's no turning back. That's yeah. what we want to do for yeah. the Filipino public. Well, very especially. nice. Thank you very much, Maribel, for spending your time with us and to all you do with the Mind Museum. Thank you, Mitz. Thank you. Thank you very much again to Maribel and my guests for being with us here on News Cafe. of inspiration, exploration, overcoming challenges, and success such as those shared by our guests tonight show how respect and a deeper appreciation of the environment, along with a greater understanding of our world, allow us to live more deeply and fully. Indeed, the future is a bright and hopeful one thanks to wonderful institutions like the California Academy of Sciences and the Mind Museum in our world. I'm Mitzi Borromeo. Thanks for watching News Cafe.